We turn now to First Minister's questions. Question number one from Jackson Carlow. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Does the First Minister now accept that there has been a decline in subject choice taken and achieved since the Curriculum for Excellence was introduced? First Minister. No, I don't. Um, as we have pointed out, as we have pointed out when we've had previous exchanges on this, uh, we have a three-year senior phase, a senior phase, of course, which is going to be subject to a review. In fact, I believe the Deputy First Minister will write to the Education Committee today, giving them the opportunity to comment uh, on the remit for that review. Uh, there is a, a wide variety of choices available to young people in our schools. And as I've said before, um, often I think we should look uh, to judge our education system at the results and the qualifications, the outcomes, in other words, that young people are leaving school with. And when you look at level five, when you look at level five qualifications, there is a higher proportion of young people now leaving school with a level five qualification. That is true for those who have one pass, two passes, three passes, four passes, five, six, and seven passes. And when you look at hires, level six qualifications, the same picture emerges a higher proportion of young people leaving with those qualifications. So that's the outcomes of our education system. I know it doesn't chime with the picture of our education system that the Conservatives want to paint, but it happens to be the reality. Jackson Carla. And there was me so full of hope after the Education Secretary's contribution yesterday, but I should have known that denial would be the mantra of the First Minister. Here's... Here's what the Deputy First Minister John Swinney told the Education Committee in May. I don't think there's been a narrowing of choice. In June, the First Minister told this chamber the same thing, brushing off concerns as lacking any evidence. But this week we learned the truth. Now we discover that just before those claims were made, civil servants confirmed to government ministers that, and I quote, a range of data and information confirms that there are on average fewer subjects taken by pupils now than was the case prior to the introduction of the new qualifications. So in May, she, told, she was told this was a real issue, as specified there. In June, she told us it wasn't. First Minister, why did you and your Education Secretary mislead the Parliament? First Minister. Uh, as Jackson Carlaw knows, or he should know if he understands the information that he's putting forward, that is not the case. Yes. There is yes. a wider yes. choice available to young people yes. today. And actually, that is borne out by the statistics I've already given to the Chamber. Whether you look at level five qualifications or level six qualifications, a higher percentage of young people are leaving school uh, with qualifications. And that's not just a higher percentage leaving with one level five or one level six qualification. The percentage has increased for people leaving with two qualifications, three right through to seven. That simply does not chime uh, with the picture that uh, Jackson Carlaw wants to paint of our education system or indeed of the achievements of uh, young people. Um, in fact, I, I, saw, uh, I saw Michael Gove tweeting on this point uh, yesterday, which was interesting given that he's a former education secretary in England because actually the Sutton Trust looked yes. at this issue yeah, in England recently. Jackson Carlow might want to hear about this because contrary to what he's saying about Scotland, he's actually more on the money if you look at the education system yes. in England. A survey of more than 1,600 teachers found that 47% of school leavers had to cut back in subject choices because of Tory funding cuts. Jackson Carlow. Denial about Aberdeen last week, denial about, Ab about education this. Nicola Sturgeon likes to argue that it doesn't matter how many subjects a child studies at any given age, her claim has only been the number of qualifications matters. Now, unfortunately for her, despite what she's just said, her own civil servants looked at that claim too. They found that before Curriculum for Excellence was introduced, pupils on average used to leave school with 10 qualifications at level five, now they leave with eight. So even on her own preferred measure, she's failing. And she knew that full well the last time she made that claim here. Now, I realise that numeracy standards might have slipped. But can the First Minister remind us, is 10 subjects achieved more or fewer than eight? First Minister. Interestingly, Jason Carlos should 
perhaps has spoken to his own education spokesperson because when uh, the Education Committee was discussing this uh, very recently, uh, Liz Smith said uh, along these lines that actually young people today had yes. more choice yes. than yes. they used to have yes. uh, in Go days harder, gone by. The fact of the matter is performance at level six has improved. Uh, performance at level five has improved. There are more young people uh, attaining vocational qualifications now yeah. than ever before. You know, back in uh, 2012, uh, there were 25,000 skill-based qualifications achieved. Uh, today, that is 54,000. And also, there are record numbers of school leavers in work, training or study. That's the reality of our education system, add into the fact that whether at level five or level six, the attainment gap is also narrowing and people get to see how wide of the mark Jackson Carlow actually is. Jackson Carlow. It's worth recalling that when she came to office, she accepted there was a problem of Scottish education. When the first minister came to office, she, yeah, she accepted there was a problem with Scottish education. The First Minister had both the goodwill and the support of this Parliament to grasp the issue. Yeah. Education was to be her number one priority. Instead, and again today, she's retreated to her comfort zone of spin and denial. Scotland now faces a choice. We can be honest about the challenges facing education. We can focus on what matters, redouble our efforts to restore Scotland's schools to their rightful reputation for a broad education, or we can hope that hosting a march and shouting into a megaphone will magic Scotland's problems away. <laughs> After a decade of division, isn't it time you put Scotland schools first? Yes. First Minister. I'm not quite sure why Jackson Carlaw chose to end that question with a reference to the Tory division that they've caused over Brexit, but we'll leave that to one side. He wants to talk about the period he wants to talk about the period since I became First Minister, so let's just do that. Uh, let's put to one side, of course, that there are a thousand, more than a thousand more teachers in our schools now than there were when I became First Minister. But let's look at higher uh, passes, level six qualifications. In 2013-14, remember I became First Minister at the end of 2014, 58% of young people 58% of young people uh, left with one or more uh, higher pass. Today, that's more than 62%. 48.6% yeah. uh, uh, left with two passes or more. Today, that's 52.4%. Let's go to the other end of the scale. 83 left with seven higher passes or more. Today, that's 9.6%. Oh. And at level six qualifications, the attainment gap is at a record low. That's the record of this government. It stands in marked contrast to our predecessors, and it stands in even starker contrast to the record of the Tory government at Westminster. Question number two, Richard Leonard. Uh, presiding officer, back in January, the Cabinet Secretary for Health made, and I quote, an absolute commitment to MSPs that the children's ward at St John's Hospital in Livingston would be open 24-7 by October of this year. Then when October came around, she told Parliament that this did not constitute a promise, but simply a commitment, not even an absolute commitment anymore. Well, it's now November and St John's Children's Ward remains closed three nights a week. First Minister, when will it finally be open to those sick children who need it 24-7? First Minister. Um, it will be open 24-7 as soon as it is clinically safe for children for it to be so. Uh, when when the recruitment levels, which have been difficult, reach a level where that ward can be open. Now, I am assuming, uh, Richard Leonard may want to correct me if I'm wrong, but I am assuming he's not arguing that that ward should be opened uh, when it is not clinically safe for children. So that's the answer to the question. Perhaps Richard Leonard might want to accept it. Richard Leonard. But you knew about these problems seven years ago. Surely, surely by now, 
you should have ensured that this hospital is safe and it is reasonable to have it functioning for children again. But it isn't just about children who need to stay in hospital who are being let down by this government. It is outpatients too. Here's what 12-year-old Erin from Whitburn told us. She said, I'm visually impaired. This means I attend hospital appointments for my eyes. Ever since I was nine months old, these appointments were at St John's in Livingston. But last month, Erin was sent to Edinburgh, which means, in her words, missing a whole day of school, which I am not pleased about. This sudden change of location is unfair. Erin may not have a vote yet, but she does have a voice, and she deserves an answer. So will the First Minister explain to Erin why she has to miss a whole day of school and why she can't get an appointment in her local hospital? First Minister. Separately, and I, I'm sure Richard Leonard does know this, separate to the work that is going on to reopen uh, the inpatient service at St John's, there is a separate strand of word, work uh, to take appointments back from Edinburgh to St John's. Uh, and my answer to Erin would be this. Of course we want her to be treated in a local hospital in St John's, but it is vital that she gets the best possible treatment. There are recruitment challenges here that are not unique to Scotland. These are UK-wide and often European-wide recruitment challenges. So our first responsibility and obligation is to make sure that there is clinically safe and high-quality care for any young person who needs it and that's what we will continue to focus on. The Health Secretary met uh, with families uh, with Angela Constance I understand this week to discuss these issues and will continue to keep them fully updated. Richard Leonard. But the consequence out in the real world is this. It's another winter for families with sick children travelling into Edinburgh at night with all the additional costs and additional stress which that brings. And now we have outpatients like Erin facing the same ordeal. And all the time, we have a children's hospital in Edinburgh costing £1.4 million a month, which cannot open its doors until October 2020. Does the First Minister not understand how angry parents and patients, including children, are over her government's failure to protect and deliver children's health services? Isn't it clear that the SNP cannot be trusted with the NHS? So, First Minister, will you apologise to Erin and to all of those children and their families who rightly expect local and accessible treatment and care? And will you act urgently to reinstate that at St John's in Livingston? First Minister. We'll, we'll continue to ensure the investment in our health service that it needs, the numbers of staff working in our health service that it needs. We won't shy away from difficult issues uh, like recruitment challenges, but we will always make sure that we are supporting clinically safe and high quality treatment as close to people's homes as possible. Uh, but the first priority is always patient safety. Uh, and in terms of the SNP's uh, record here, when, I, when the SNP took office, uh, in 2007, of course, I was health secretary at that time, and a number of local hospitals were under real threat, uh, whether that was the Vale of Leven in Greater Glasgow and Clyde, or indeed St John's Hospital, left on the track that Labour had these hospitals on, they probably wouldn't be open at all right now. That's the reality. Like accident and emergency in Monklands, like accident and emergency in Ayr, they would have been closed. We've protected local services, we will continue to support local services, but we will continue to prioritise patient safety because that's what any responsible government does. It's something that I don't know Richard Leonard will ever get the opportunity to be. Thank you. I have a number of constituency supplementaries. The first from Peter Chapman. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. And I declare an interest as a partner in the farming business. Is the First Minister aware of the serious situation facing 14 dairy farmers in Aberdeenshire? These 14, which comprise the bulk of the dairy industry north of Aberdeen, have been told by their milk buyer, Muller, that they have one year to find a new buyer, after which their contract will cease. There is, an ob there is no obvious processor to take up these contracts. Are there any plans to help these farmers? First Minister. Uh, yes, we will do everything we can to give assistance uh, to these farmers. I can well understand the anxiety 
uh, and the, the concern that they have at uh, this particular development. I will ask the uh, Rural uh, Secretary to be in contact uh, with the member uh, and uh, by extension with the farmers to make sure that the Scottish Government is offering whatever assistance we possibly can. Emma Harper to be followed by Edward Mountain. The Salim family, eh, Muhammad, Razia, Fatima and Saira, have been resident in Dumfries area for the past 13 years and are currently being split up by the Home Office, who have granted temporary leave to remain to only one member of the family, the youngest daughter. The family are attending Immigration Court in Glasgow tomorrow, where my office will be attending to speak to support the case for their right to remain in Scotland together as a family. In the absence of any sense from the, both the Home Office and the Secretary of State for Scotland, can I ask the First Minister to join me in fully condemning the actions of the Home Office in this case and confirm that in an independent Scotland we will have a humane, dignified and person-centred approach to immigration? Yeah, yeah. First Minister. <clears throat> um, I Thank Emma Harper for raising this issue. In fact, I, I think I may have met the Salim family on Monday when I uh, visited Dumfries myself. Um, obviously, if their case is before a court over the next few days, uh, I'll be limited uh, and careful in what I say. But let me say in general, firstly, they seem like a, a lovely family and a credit uh, to this country. Uh, but more generally, um, I do want to see Scotland have an immigration and asylum system that is humane. Uh, that encourages people to come and make a home in Scotland and make a contribution to Scotland. And I think one of the many benefits of Scotland being independent is that we get the chance to build that kind of country, uh, that kind of society, with that kind of approach to immigration, uh, which would be uh, much better and much different to the disgraceful, hostile environment that the Tories preside over. Yeah. Edward Mountain to be followed by Mark Ruskell. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Auditor General has just produced a very critical report on the finances of NHS Highland, and patients are rightly very concerned. It is clear the Board of NHS Highland needs significantly more help to achieve their objectives. Will the First Minister ensure that the Cabinet Secretary for Health provides that help without placing NHS Highland into level five of the escalation process? First Minister. Uh, we'll continue, as we always do, to work closely with health boards to make sure that they are managing their budgets, but also that they're providing uh, the quality of patient care that they have a responsibility to provide. NHS Highland resource budget for uh, this financial year increased by 2.9%, uh, and of course the health budget overall is increasing and is now at record levels. So we will continue to properly resource our National Health Service. It will always uh, work within pressures. That's been particularly the case in recent years, and we'll work closely with NHS Highland and other boards to make sure that they deliver uh, the services that patients need. Mark Ruskell to be followed by Liam Kerr. Last Friday, NHS Fife published a long-awaited report on the health impacts of flaring at Moss Moran. They said, and I quote, that flaring was not acceptable and that it can plausibly affect health in the widest sense. Does the First Minister now believe that communities living in the shadow of Moss Moran should be compensated? Minister. Uh, well, we'll always consider uh, issues or suggestions like that. I certainly do understand uh, the concerns and the anxieties of people around flaring. That's why SEPA, for example, have taken this issue uh, so seriously and will continue uh, to look at the options it has around enforcement action. Of course, health impacts are very important and we'll consider uh, the evidence that Mark Ruskell has mentioned today uh, carefully and uh, do so as we would always seek to do so in consultation with the local community. Liam Kerr to be followed by Oliver Mundell. Thank you, Presiding Officer. First Minister, the people of the North East have been poorly served by lack of funding and support to NHS Grampian for years. The recent infrastructure investment plan stated the main construction work on the Baird Family Hospital and Anchor Centre will now be later than previously reported. It was supposed to be completed by 2021. Given concerns around cost and recent incidents in the wider NHS estate, can the First Minister give the people of the North East a realistic timeline for the opening of this vital facility? First Minister. Well, we need to make sure the services are the right services and they're uh, delivered in line with budget. But we're increasing health budgets. We're increasing health budgets for NHS Grampian. We're increasing health budgets for health boards across the country. And I would uh, just again point out to the Conservatives, as I frequently do when issues like uh, spending on health or education or justice or any other matter 
are raised. If we followed uh, the strictures and the recommendations of the Conservatives when it comes to setting our budgets, if we had prioritised tax cuts for the richest in our country instead of extra funding for the National Health Service, our health service right now would have more than £500 million less in its budget than it currently does. Oliver Mundell. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Given the serious concerns expressed previously by the Education Committee and in this chamber, does the First Minister agree with me that it is deeply worrying that Dumfries and Galloway Council are planning to axe all instrumental tuition in schools for those not sitting SQA exams? And will she raise the issue urgently with her SNP colleagues in the Council administration? First Minister. I think the Government and in particular the Education Secretary has uh, made his views very clear on uh, music tuition. We would strongly encourage uh, all local authorities to maintain uh, their music tuition and not to reduce it and that goes for Dumfries and Galloway as it would for other local authorities across the country. Question number three, Willie Rennie. This week NHS Highland told patients to seek treatment elsewhere because Regmore Hospital is nearly full up. After 12 years running our NHS, is the First Minister proud of that record? First Minister. Uh, our health service is seeing more patients than ever before. I mean, if you look just at accident emergency, this is uh, for the country overall. Despite uh, the pressures, more people are being admitted, discharged or transferred within four hours in this calendar year uh, so far uh, compared to the previous uh, year. Uh, we've got record funding, record numbers of staff. Of course, we want to uh, encourage patients to seek help and treatment in the best possible place for them. Uh, that is not always in hospital, that's often in primary care or in the community. But our health service is doing more than it's ever done before and I think it deserves our grateful thanks for that. Willie Rennie. So not one recognition of the problem at Regmore Hospital, not one recognition. This is astonishing from the First Minister. And it seems a pretty shabby way to deal with waiting times by telling people to just go away. This is not happening just in the Highlands either. It's happening in the borders, in Paisley, in East Kilbride, every part of the country. And that's before the winter crisis hits. People rely on the NHS and they are being let down by this government. Thousands of people are stuck in hospital, even though they are fit to go home, despite the solemn promise from this government. Audit Scotland say the NHS is critically short of staff. The Royal College of Emergency Medicine say we are hundreds of A&E beds short. And the waiting time guarantee, it's broken every hour of every day. After 12 years in power, has the First Minister got any more excuses? First Minister. Well, the Audit Scotland report actually said that the NHS was treating more patients than Absolutely. before. It said performance against most of the waiting times targets was increasing uh, and improving. So that's what the Audit Scotland report said. But I want to I want to challenge Willie Rennie very directly because some of his language there I think was deeply regrettable. The NHS doesn't tell anybody to go away and I think it is deeply irresponsible for any member of this chamber to suggest that it does. What, what the NHS does do and it does it in the interests of patients and frankly every member of this chamber should support it in doing so Absolutely. is encourage patients uh, to seek treatment in the place that is best for them that may be uh, a GP yeah. uh, surgery it may be a pharmacist it may be another community service hospital and A&E is not always the best place for treatment to be so I was uh, visiting a community pharmacy in Rutherglen just Absolutely. at the start of this week expanding its services and it uh, seeing the benefit of seeing more patients that would otherwise go to GPs or to acute care. So that's the sensible, responsible way of redesigning our health service as we have record investment in our health service. And for one, a representative of the party that was the co-architect of austerity to get up here and talk about spending in our health service really takes the biscuit. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. We've got some further supplementary questions. The first from the first from Gillian Martin. All right, all right. Come on, 
Uh, are members finished? Thank you. Supplementary questions, first from Julian Martin. President officer, I understand that as a result of UK-wide delays of Florence Tetra procured by Public Health England, NHS Grampian has taken the decision to prioritise the available vaccinations to those most at risk and children aged two to five years old. Can the First Minister tell me what action has been taken to ensure that all eligible children get the flu vaccine as soon as possible? First Minister. Well, can I thank Gillian Martin for raising uh, this issue? Uh, there is a delay in the supply of a proportion of the children's uh, vaccine, which is procured by Public Health England on behalf of all of the UK, and this delay is affecting all parts of the UK. Um, I want to take the opportunity to reassure parents and families that we're doing everything possible to minimise any disruption that is caused uh, by the delay. We're working with Public Health England, Health Protection Scotland, boards and other relevant partners to ensure that all eligible children get their flu vaccine as soon as possible. Uh, we've taken the decision that those most at risk and children aged two to five years old will be prioritised initially with boards working to ensure that all other eligible children, such as those at primary school, receive their vaccine as quickly as possible. Tom Meeson to be followed by Shona Robson. Tom Meeson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. May I remind colleagues of my being a councillor in the city of Aberdeen. Last week, the First Minister told me... Last week, the First Minister told me Aberdeen City Council had never applied for funding for the new art gallery, calling my question a bit rich. However, at 10 o'clock on Friday night, the First Minister's spokesman confirmed that, in fact, the Council had applied during the, during the planning stages in 2013. And the First Minister was forced to correct the official report late yesterday. So will the First Minister take this chance to apologise for mis misleading this chamber? First Minister. I, I have... I I believe already written to Tom Mason and indeed to the presiding officer. Um, it is the case that no approach was made to the Scottish Government or Historic Environment Scotland in the planning or the business case uh, phase stages. Uh, an application was made to Creative Scotland in 20... I'm trying to answer the question if they want to listen. Um, an application was made to Creative Scotland in 2013, which was not successful. I was not aware of that application when I answered the question last week, and I apologise uh, for that. Uh, the, the allegation that was made, though, presiding officer, uh, last week in Aberdeen, that somehow there was a political motivation on the part of this government for funding uh, the V&A in Dundee, but not the Aberdeen uh, Arts Centre, is absolutely not true, and I would hope nobody uh, would repeat that accusation again. Robinson. I know uh, firsthand the devastating impact that Tory austerity has had in my constituency of Dundee East. Rising numbers of children fed from food banks, families of EU citizens who are unsure they can stay here, businesses and jobs on the line. Does the First Minister agree that the first words out of Boris Johnson's mouth as he lands in Scotland today should be, I'm sorry? First Minister. First Minister. Yes, I do. Um, this it is actually a serious issue. When Boris Johnson uh, comes to Scotland for a fleeting visit that I think he's describing as a regional visit uh, today, no doubt to give the Scottish Tories their marching orders for the remainder of the election yeah. campaign, he should take the opportunity to apologise for Tory austerity, for Tory welfare cuts, for the mess and the chaos of Brexit and for the misery that has been heaped on Scottish people by the Tories for too many years now. Uh, but I would say, finally, presiding officer, uh, that I'm so confident that Boris Johnson will not go down very well with Scottish voters in this election uh, that my words to him as he leaves Scotland this afternoon may be, haste you back. Thank you. I was hoping we were going to get through without a direct reference to the general election, but... I just remind all members, remind all members, try not to do direct campaigning in the chamber. Maurice Corrie.
Presiding officer, as Remembrance Sunday approaches this weekend, will the First Minister join me in expressing the deep, deep gratitude of this Parliament to men and women of our British Armed Forces who over the years have defended our nation and for those who paid the ultimate sacrifice, and also to recognise their families who have supported them so well. Yes, can I uh, wholeheartedly uh, associate myself with those remarks? I'll be, as uh, I always am, very proud and privileged uh, to represent uh, the government and indeed the country at the National Remembrance Service here in Edinburgh on Sunday morning. Um, and I will certainly uh, be remembering and paying tribute to all of those in our armed forces uh, down the years who have uh, sacrificed, often paying the ultimate sacrifice, not just to keep us safe, but to allow us to enjoy the freedoms that we today take for granted. Uh, I'll also uh, be paying tribute, as we all do, to serving personnel uh, and to their families. Uh, the uh, life uh, for uh, a family member of uh, a member of our armed forces, I'm sure, is not an easy one. So our gratitude goes to them, just as it does to those who have and continue to serve in our armed forces. And Jenny Marr. Presiding officer, I raised the issue last week of the Tayside breast oncologist's right to reply to the Healthcare Improvement Scotland report, which was published in April. The oncologists uh, submitted their right to reply at the end of April this year. It has never seen the light of day. It has never been published. I received the delayed answer to my written question from the Cabinet Secretary for Health, who says, it's not a matter for the Scottish Government, it's a matter for Healthcare Improvement Scotland. Can the First Minister tell the oncologists, uh, confirm the Cabinet Secretary's view, that the fact that their response has never been published is not a matter for her government and is not something that she will demand that Healthcare Improvement Scotland publishes? First Minister. Well, the independent report by Healthcare Improvement Scotland uh, I know had input from experts locally and nationally, including from the Chief Medical Officer, Chief Pharmaceutical Officer, uh, who directly reported to his concerns that had been raised by local oncologists earlier this year. Uh, but the process by which has conducted this review was independent of the Scottish Government. Uh, we would expect them to consider all feedback they receive. But I would say this to Jenny Mara, and I mean it, it sincerely. If she imagines in another context, if I was instructing uh, Healthcare Improvement Scotland around uh, an inquiry that they were carrying out, uh, then there would be understandable and legitimate concerns raised, no doubt by members in this chamber, about government interference. If we have independent inquiries, it is crucial that their independence is respected, and usually I have members uh, demanding that that is the case of the Scottish Government. And Ross Greer. Thank you. It's been over two years since the government brought forward a debate on anything to do with our schools to this chamber. If the First Minister is so confident of the government's record in education, will there be a debate before the end of the year? And if not, why not? First Minister. Well, there's debates regularly on education. Uh, the Deputy First Minister. The Deputy First Minister gives regular statements. I get questioned on education. Uh, I am absolutely certain that before the end of this year, uh, there will be further debate in this chamber about education matters. Question number four, Kenneth Gibson. Thank you, presiding officer. I hope to bring a zen quality to proceedings after uh, this afternoon's turmoil. <laughs> to ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's response is to recent figures showing that the number of workers earning less than the real living wage has decreased by 13% in the last year. First Minister. I welcome analysis published by the Office for National Statistics last week, which shows that the number of employees earning less than the real living wage in Scotland has decreased by 15% from 473,000 in 2018 to 400,000 in 2019. This means that 83.1% of all employees over the age of 18 in Scotland are earning the real living wage or more. Uh, and Scotland, of course, remains the best performing of all four UK countries with the highest proportion of employees paid the real living wage or more. Uh, so there is work to be done, but I hope that progress is welcomed by everybody across the chamber. Kenneth Gibson. I thank the First Minister for that answer and such progress is welcome. However, in Scotland, 11% of women and 8% of men in full-time work and a third of women and 40% of men in part-time work still earn less than the hourly real living wage. How can the Scottish Government, with the very limited powers it has in this area of policy, ensure that more and more paid workers earn at least the real living wage 
And does she agree that it's time for opposition members offering express concern about this issue to back the devolution of powers over the real living wage to this Parliament? First Minister. <coughs> Uh, yes, we will continue to call for the devolution of employment law to ensure that workers uh, do receive at least the real uh, living wage. Uh, last year, I gave a commitment that by the end of this parliament, we will attach fair work first criteria to as many grants and funding streams as possible and extend the range of public sector uh, contracts that these criteria will apply to. Our fair work first approach commits employers to a number of fair work criteria and crucially that includes payment of the real living wage. We will also continue to work with the Poverty <laughs> Alliance to promote the living wage. Uh, there are currently over 1,600 accredited living wage employers in Scotland and of course uh, this Monday we'll see the start of Living Wage Week when a new living wage rate will be announced but there is absolutely no doubt uh, that while we are doing good work in this there is more to do and we would be able to do more and be even more effective if uh, control over employment law lay in the hands of this parliament not in the hands of a Tory government at Westminster. Rhoda Grant. Thank you, Presiding Officer. It's clear that the Scottish Government are still not doing enough to make Scotland a living wage nation, with one in five people still earning below £9 an hour, and the vast majority of them are women. Also, it, in a statement to the Parliament yesterday, it was made clear that government procurement contracts are still being let without an assist, insistence that the real living wage is paid. So can I ask, what, when will the Scottish Government ensure all their contracts embrace the real living wage for those contracted with? First Minister. Well, I've set out in response to Kenny Gibson the action we're taking around Fair Work First, which I would hope uh, Labour members would uh, warmly welcome. But we are doing uh, everything we can uh, to extend payment of the living wage. Uh, we have to largely do that on a voluntary basis for one very important reason is that we do not have power over employment law. So we cannot by statute uh, set the level of the living wage and mandate by law employers to pay that. So if Labour are now saying that they want to join with us and demand the devolution of employment law, then I would say better late than never. Let's get on with it and put the powers in the hands of this parliament. Question number five, Michelle Ballantyne. Thank you. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's response is to reports that attacks on staff at six NHS boards increased in the last year. First Minister. Well, nobody uh, should be the victim of any attack for doing their job, uh, not least our hard-working NHS staff who do so much to care for people across the country. Uh, we've been very clear that health boards must take appropriate action against anyone who assaults a staff member on occasion. That will include criminal proceedings uh, where that is appropriate, although that, of course, is always a matter for the Crown. Any violence or aggression towards NHS staff is unacceptable. And of course, that is one of the reasons that we extended the Emergency Workers Scotland Act 2005 to give legal protection to all NHS Scotland staff. Michelle Barton. I thank the First Minister for her response and I am in total agreement with her comments. Our NHS and public service staff work extremely hard to look after us in our hour of need, but increasingly they face threats. The Scottish NHS boards alone have had to spend an extra 40% since 2014 on private security. NHS Lothian has spent almost 7 million on private security contractors since 2014. Does the First Minister agree that it's unacceptable that our NHS boards who are in financial difficulty are having to lay out increasing sums for private security? First Minister. Uh, yes, I do agree with that. And the message that should come from all of us in a very united fashion is that any attack on any member of our NHS staff is absolutely unacceptable and we should have zero tolerance towards that. Uh, the Emergency Workers Act, which was passed initially under a previous administration in 2005, was extended. It was extended when I was Health Secretary. We uh, took the provisions of that act, which provided legal protection to ambulance workers, doctors, nurses, midwives who were working in a hospital or responding to an emergency uh, to cover uh, health service staff even when they're working in the community. So the legal protections are there. The penalty uh, can involve a, a jail sentence or a, a hefty fine or both. Uh, but the message that should come from all of us is that anybody uh, who attacks any member of our NHS staff is attacking our precious National Health Service. It is not acceptable. It should never be seen as acceptable. Uh, and we should send that message in a very united and very loud fashion from this chamber today. And question number six, Daniel Johnson. 
to ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government is doing to ensure the safety and well-being of children with additional support needs. First Minister. Uh, we're committed to ensuring the safety and well-being of all of Scotland's children and young people, uh, along with local authorities who are responsible for the care, safety and welfare of pupils in school. Uh, there are a range of guidance and approaches available to support local authorities and schools. Uh, physical intervention, physical restraint and seclusion uh, should only ever be used as an absolute last resort uh, and only when it's in the best interest of the child or young person and never for disciplinary purposes. The unlawful use of physical intervention or seclusion is completely unacceptable in every Every intervention should be carefully monitored and reviewed. Daniel Johnson. In December last year, the Children's Commissioner published a report on the use of restraint and seclusion. It identified 2,674 such incidents in 1718, experienced by 386 children. That's an average of seven per child. And if that's an average, that means that for some children, being physically restrained is just part of their typical school week or even their typical school day. And according to the Commissioner, this is likely just to be the tip of the iceberg. We're one year on and we've seen no action. So that is why Enable have launched their campaign in safe hands. So will the First Minister commit to a formal government response to their calls that they set out to bring forward specific guidance on the use of restraint in schools to establish a duty to report and of transparency around these practices? Will she consider putting these duties into law? And finally, does she agree with me that children have a right to education, a right to be protected from violence? Because the real meaning of seclusion and restraint is that children are being denied those very rights in Scottish schools every single day. First Minister. Well, firstly, Yes, I do agree uh, with the points on a right to education and a right to be protected uh, from uh, physical intervention or, or violence, and I, I think that's an important point to make. Uh, in terms of the action that has been taken, and it, it is not the case that no action is being taken, uh, we published guidance on restraint and seclusion back in June 2017, but that guidance is currently being revised to take into account recommendations that have been made by the Children's Commissioner and also by the Equality and Human Rights Commission. And we want to work in partnership with education authorities, with ADES and COSLA, so that we get that right and ensure that the correct approach is taken uh, to recording and monitoring as well, uh, as well, of course, as making sure uh, that we uh, have a situation where physical intervention or restraint and seclusion is a last resort and only used in the best interests uh, of children. Uh, Daniel Johnson made a point about putting that on a statutory footing. That is certainly something uh, we would be happy to consider as we undertake this review. Uh, the recommendations that were made by Enable Scotland uh, this week in its report will be carefully considered by the Scottish Government uh, and all of those recommendations will feed in to the work we're doing to review uh, the guidance and I will ask the Deputy First Minister to keep Daniel Johnson updated as that work progresses. Thank you very much and that concludes First Minister's questions. We're going to move on shortly to members' business in the name of George Adam on recognition for nuclear test veterans. But we're just going to shortly suspend to allow members, ministers and members of the public to change seats. Short suspension.